Kaylin, should we get started? All right, let's do it. So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we wanted to bring a session that we've done a couple times in the past uh, for Beta and, and others in the Twin Cities area. We wanted to bring it to Startup Week. Um, and so we're, we're excited to be able to do that. And as you know, the session is on executive compensation. And so what is that? What does that mean? What are we gonna actually talk about? Um, it's really, uh, and, and Kaylin is our expert in this area, and so it's great to have her join us, but uh, it's really looking at uh, kind of the personal side for founders. And what are some things to keep in mind that a busy founder that's solely focused on growing their business um, should keep in mind uh, so that they end up with the best case scenario um, if there's a potential sale um, or if they're just setting up their company for long-term growth. And so we are going to talk about options. We're going to talk about different types of stock. Uh, we're going to talk about how to set up employment agreements uh, so that founders are you know, protected in, in the case of changing control, et cetera. Um, so all of the things that deal with you know, not only compensation, but just general ways for founders to make sure um, they're doing all the right things. And so along those lines, I'll, I'll introduce Kaylin. She's part of a team here uh, within J.K. Morgan Private Bank. Uh, we call it Advice Lab. And so they're kind of our internal think tank. And her job is solely to be um, as smart as possible in the area of executive compensation. And so she works with um, all the way from day one of a startup company, helping people uh, set things up the right way, all the way to Fortune 500, some of the largest C-suites of some of the largest companies um, in the country and the world. So uh, she's definitely an expert in this area, and we're pr very uh, privileged to have her here with us. So I'll uh, pass it off to her just for some kind of opening comments, and then we'll we'll get started. Thanks, Clayton. I'm excited to be here. Sad I can't be there in person. You know, what is in person these days, right? Um, so as we jump into talking about some executive compensation thoughts here, certainly if you have questions as we go on, feel free to chime in, feel free to type questions, feel free to jump in um, with a video and audio. Either way is fine with me. Um, and if you have experiences that you've learned the hard way, also feel free to share those because I do think that helps bring things to life for people as we go through some of this. Um, so with that, I guess we'll get started and jump into some of the content. So typically when I'm working with folks in the startup space, one of the first questions ends up being, what about formation? How am I structured? Why does it matter? What, what do we do from there? Um, and in my world, the reason that this comes up a lot is for what's known as qualified small business stock, QSBS, which is essentially a way for founders and early employees and whatnot to potentially sell $10 million worth of their stock without paying any taxes on it if they qualify and follow some rules here. So I haven't gotten your attention. Let's <laughs> dive into that. So wait, real quick, Kaylin, because I think that is attention grabbing. But if, if anyone wants to just like maybe say in the chat, how their company is structured, um, you know, or feel free to share audio and video, like we mentioned, but it would help to just kind of give us a, get us a grasp of where people are at and that kind of thing. So welcome, you know, we want to make this interactive if we can. And so, you know, welcome you to do that, but go ahead now and give them the, the good stuff. Sounds good. So in order to get this wonderful $10 million, there's a few things that need to have occurred. So you need to have been structured as a C-Corp, which I know many startups, they tend to start as LLCs, and maybe at some point think of converting to a C-Corp, that's fine. Um, so if you started as an LLC, just make sure you are converting at some point to a C-Corp and reissuing your shares. Um, you need to have held the shares for at least five years in a day from um, receipt of those from a C-Corp. So again, if you started as an LLC and then two years in you convert to a C-Corp, you need to hold those shares for five years from that C-Corp conversion. Um, it also needs to be in an approved industry. So typically any type of industry that makes a physical product, if you're in a technology space and that's the um, hub of what you do, that counts. It doesn't count for a truly service-based industry. Think something like doctor's offices, lawyer's offices, things like that, where the real value of the company ends up being the individuals and not whatever product they are creating. But typically in the startup world, many of them do tend to qualify. Um, the other thing to know is you have to have acquired these shares before your company is worth 50 million in gross assets. So not valuation, but gross assets. So again, if you're doing that conversion from LLC to C-Corp, you want to make sure you're doing that before 
crossing that threshold so that those shares could potentially count. Um, if you find that those do count, or you might just be looking at what you have now and saying, hey, like, sounds like I have a lot of, I think I check all the boxes on that for some shares I've been holding for a while. Great news, there was no additional box that you had to check at any point. Um, all you have to do is in the year of sale, you need to find a CPA who's willing to sign off and say, these shares count, they're QSBS, and they'll attach a letter to your tax returns for the year of the, of the sale saying we are not going to be paying taxes on this amount because it's qualified under QSBS. So that's the thing that a lot of folks haven't heard of necessarily, and it can be so impactful. $10 million without paying taxes on it is huge. And to the extent that you do have more than 10 million, there's more strategies we could dive into and think about. I don't want to overwhelm us at this stage, but just know if you are in that lucky position, there's more food for thought there as well. Yeah. So if I could just highlight a couple things so that people make sure they get the important parts is if you've converted to a C-Corp, make sure you reissue. So if you're early stages, you know, you're not close to the five-year mark, make sure you reissue your shares. And then if you are getting closer to that five-year mark, I think start having a conversation. We'd love detail about, you know, if this would work for you. Um, and we do that often, you know, before people actually have to go to a CPA or even an, an attorney to get that advice. So, um, Kaylin, is that right? Kind of, if you're really early, just make sure you reissue your shares once you become a C-Corp. And if you're later on, have those conversations and we're happy to help. Yep. I mean, I think starting as an LLC, a lot of companies do it. It makes a lot of sense. You don't yet know if you'll be successful. It's the cheaper and easier way to structure initially. Mm -hmm. But if as you're getting a little bit into it, you're a year or two into it, it feels like this really could be something, you're raising money, whatever, you believe that you want to have some type of exit, that's where it probably ends up making sense to think about reissuing and making sure you get good advice around that so that things are done correctly and your shares would qualify. Great. Yeah. Um, okay, next topic that comes up a lot for folks with executive compensation is obviously the equity awards, right? So typically what we see at startups is um, most startup companies will grant what's known as incentive stock options, ISOs, um, for some of the C-suites or as you get larger, it's potential that there could be granting non-qualified stock options as well. Or even if you have um, contractors perhaps, or you have people that are not based in the US, they might be, they are not eligible to receive ISOs, so they would be getting the non-qualified stock options from day one anyways. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference between those two awards. And then the other type of equity award that might come into play here would be either restricted stock or restricted stock units. Um, so restricted stock, I think, tends to be earlier stage, like if you're, most founders in theory should be buying their shares and it should be theirs outright, but sometimes some of the founders' shares will have restrictions on them and they will be restricted stock. So that's definitely something to keep an eye on when you are joining a company, understanding what it is that they are offering to you, um, making sure you know some of those nuances and how to be smart around some of those things. And also if you're in a position where you're hiring people, understanding what the marketplace is offering, understanding what people, what questions people will have and what they're sort of expecting um, in that position. So just high level right there, I think that's just a good framework. Um, we wanna get into the weeds, which, you know, I like to get into the weeds, but I can bring it back up as needed. Um, incentive stock options and non-qualified stock options, as I mentioned, are the two types of options. Um, they are very distinct in the sense that incentive stock options ISOs, those potentially have preferential tax treatment. So meaning you could pay long-term capital gains tax on those versus basically every other type of equity award, you will pay ordinary income tax on that. Think of at least like a 13% differential on that number. So 13% more in ordinary income, at least. Um, so ISOs therefore are much more valuable in the sense that you're paying less taxes on them, but they are the trickiest. So there's a lot of rules and hoops to follow to get these ISOs right. So what does that mean? First off, in order to get that long-term capital gains treatment, there's two things you need to do. One, you need to make sure it's been at least two years in a day from grant date before you are selling your eventual shares. Also, two, you need to make sure that you've exercised your ISOs at least one year and one day in advance of selling. A lot of information, I know. So what does that look like? It, you could, let's say, invest after one year. You exercise your options at that point, hold an additional year and a day, sell the stock 
at that point when it's been two years and a day from grant, and then that would qualify for long-term capital gains. And at that point, you would pay long-term capital gains in the difference between sale price and that original strike price. There's not a specific tax due at the time of exercise with your incentive stock options. However, there's potential that you fall into what's known as alternative minimum tax, which is own other deep dive, which I'll go into in a minute. But I think the most important part of ISOs to know is they are so valuable, but so many people I work with don't take the time to get the things right and follow the steps to make sure they are getting that better tax treatment. So essentially I'll meet with clients as they're six months away from some type of transaction or the company is presenting them with an opportunity to tender some of their shares. And hey, they know they have these, they only have ISOs, they don't have anything else. They end up having to exercise and sell and not hit that holding period that I just referenced. And so instead everything gets taxed, taxed at ordinary income. So that's why it's really important to A, know what you're holding, B, make sure if you have ISOs, you are exercising those at least one year and a day before a potential transaction. And C, if you have you know a bunch of different ISOs, maybe just think about taking some off the table, exercising a little bit at a time in a given year so that you're starting the clock on some. Obviously, it can be a big outlay to put money into a private company. You probably are already very concentrated in this company relative to your broader balance sheet. So I'm not suggesting that suddenly one day you take all of your outside liquidity and dump it into the company. But if you do a few hundred a year, a few thousand a year, if that's something that feels okay to you, that can make a lot of sense and pay off in a big way down the line. So that's just something I want to flag for you because I can't tell you how many folks have ISOs but don't get to take proper advantage of them. I'll pause there. Clayton, I think you're muted. I was gonna say, I had a couple things. We love to take questions as well. Um, but I think you'll start to see as we continue on here, a couple patterns. Um, one is that whenever we start talking about taxes and especially when it comes to uh, different strategies around taxes, we're gonna always recommend that there's further conversations with the CPA. Um, but what that means is that we're able to put on events like this. We're then able to have follow-up conversations, you know, more uh, in-depth detail to your specific situation. And then you're equipped when you do go to have a conversation with the CPA, you already know a baseline and uh, amount of information um, so that you're ready to have those conversations. So that's kind of the approach we take. And like I said, that's a theme that you'll see with a lot of these different strategies, um, as well as uh, what, what Kaylin was saying about, um, you know, the, what was the last, the C that you mentioned was exercising a little bit. What was A and B? Basically doing some overtime. And then A and B didn't write it down. I was, <laughs> I think it was just um, making sure you're doing stuff far enough in advance. So exactly. That's advance. what I was going to get to is that that's another common theme in that um, a lot of these strategies, you can't do six months out from a potential sale. You have to start thinking about them a year, sometimes, you know, really two years to give yourself that cushion because they take time to implement and do them the right way. So it's making sure, you know, depending on what stage you're at, making sure you're set up correctly in the first place and then making sure you're able to plan ahead. Um, as you go forward. So just a couple of common themes that you'll see and things to keep in mind. And I will say, as you're looking at this for yourself or hearing some of this right now, you might be saying, oh man, I haven't looked at any of this. I haven't been being strategic about any of this. My whole job is meeting with people who can be so smart and so focused and have grown their companies to such great um, sizes and everything, but they are so focused on running the business completely understandably, and they're not looking at their personal stuff. And they're just like, just keep trucking, just keep trucking, and hopefully I get to a point where this is worth something in the future. I'll worry about it then. And I completely understand that mentality. It's just that if we could take a step back, look at our own stuff a little bit in advance, it could be a lot more optimal down the line. So that's why we're bringing this to you. But don't feel bad if this feels overwhelming or if you haven't thought about some of this stuff yet because you are in very good company. Definitely. Well, let's actually pause for a second for questions. I know I, it's always a pet peeve of mine when people are like, are there any questions? And they just keep going so you don't get a chance. So it, are there any questions? Um, we'll just take a second here. If anyone wants to jump in, you can use the chat or share audio and video either way. Okay, next item. All right. Um, so just finishing up, I guess, the ISOs. Um, I briefly mentioned AMT, I wanna to touch on that for a minute. Um, that stands for alternative minimum tax. 
again, not to try to go deep in the weeds here on taxes, but I think this is an important point because people hear that they have the ISOs. They know that's the good kind of option. They know they don't have to pay taxes at the time of exercise. They exercise a huge amount of, of ISOs, and then suddenly they have this really nasty surprise come tax time where they owe a really big bill that they didn't expect. So I want to help you guys avoid that or at least be aware of it. Um, just briefly, I guess, talking about a little bit how this tax stuff works. So there's always two tax bills that are calculated when your accountant does your taxes or TurboTax does your taxes. Um, there's what you think of as your regular tax bill, which is all of your W-2, earned income, any dividends, minus any deductions that you get to take for charity, mortgages, things like that. And then they apply a higher tax rate to that total remaining number. Then in the U.S., there's a system called alternative minimum tax, which is purpose is to make sure everyone pays their fair share. And so suddenly all of those deductions are added back in, as well as income from what's known as AMT preference items, which for our case is that spread on that ISO exercise. So that income's not included in your regular income, but it is included in the AMT income. So if that income is big enough, um, and a lower tax rate is applied to AMT than regular. But if that income is big enough from the ISO exercise, it could result in you having a bigger tax bill than you normally would have. You only ever pay the greater of those two numbers. So that's why um, if you had a really significant exercise, that's why you could have a bigger tax bill than what you expected. Um, paying AMT is not the end of the world. You do get a credit for it. So you'll get a credit for how much you paid over your regular tax bill. And you can apply that in any future year where your regular tax bill is greater than AMT. But it is a big deal if you didn't plan for it and you don't have liquidity for it. I've had bankers call me up and say, I have a client. They're going to exercise a million dollars worth of ISOs today. I'm good to go, right? Start waving my arms like, please wait, no. Um, because as many of you know, in the startup world, likely you have a lot of income from your um, equity, but your cash income is probably relatively low. You're not making a million dollars a year to help offset that million dollar ISO exercise. So if someone were to exercise a million dollars of ISOs, that could result in almost $300,000 of taxes in that given year, which they weren't expecting. So that's why I always just want to make sure people are aware that AMT can happen, that they plan for it. You know, if that person had 300000 sitting in a bank account fully ready to pay that, fine, that could make a lot of sense. They exercised sooner before the prices went up. That could be a good strategy. But if you don't have that money or that liquidity sitting there, then obviously that's not a good position to be in. So we help people think through how much they have to put in, how much they want to put in, and all of the broader things to consider when it comes to these exercise strategies. Uh, that's great. Kaylin, real quickly, I had a question coming in the chat, so I just want to make sure we address that. Um, mm -hmm. This kind of goes back to what we were saying about our approach to you know, providing advice and, and just kind of educating people, pointing them in the right direction. So uh, events like this or uh, founders, you know, that just started in the last couple months and they're just getting going and they're trying to make sure they do the right thing from the beginning. Uh, happy to have conversations along those lines and make sure people get started on the right foot. But I think when we can really start to be impactful is when some of these strategies, um, as far as making sure the founder actually walks away with as much money in their pocket as possible when there's a potential transaction. Uh, so again, you have to start doing stuff a year or two out from that transaction. So when we can really start to apply a lot of what we're talking about and put it into action is kind of a year or two away from potentially being acquired or even you know doing an IPO, um, any sort of transaction, bringing on you know minority investors even is is you know something we should be talking about. So that's, or even tender offers that's been coming up a lot lately for me. So yeah. like a year or so out from a tender or something, happy to help plan there as well. Right, great, great. Um, just let's briefly touch on the non-qualified stock options and then I'll move out of tax land, I promise. Um, so incentive stock options, like I said, better tax rates, long-term capital gains if you do everything right. Non-qualified stock options, you will always pay ordinary income tax on those. You will pay um, ordinary income tax at the time of exercise. So unlike the incentive stock option where you only have to pay the strike at exercise, for a non-qualified stock option, you have to be ready with the liquidity to pay both the strike and whatever ordinary income tax exists between the difference between um, the strike price and the current 409A price or whatever market valuation you're using. So that's an important thing to note and to make sure you're ready with that liquidity. That being said, 
the sooner you can exercise your non-qualified stock option, probably the better because there's a smaller spread between strike and um, the 409A, meaning there's less to pay taxes on. Um, in some companies, you'll even see what's known as an early exercise provision, meaning you could theoretically exercise your options as soon as they're granted to you, even though you don't yet own them because they have not vested. Um, it's a little bit risky because you're exercising something that you don't technically own. And if you leave the company or something happens, you paid for something that you don't own. However, it could be a smart strategy to at least do some of them that way, because if you exercise non-qualified stock options right when they're granted, essentially, that strike price will equal your foreign NA valuation. There's no spread. So you pay ordinary income tax on nothing. So basically that turns it into an ISO sort of because you're only having to pay the strike price. So that's just another thing to think about. All of this information should be in your plan documents. Another thing that we'll spend time looking at or thinking about as well, what types of protections do you have in your equity plan document? What types of flexibility exists there? So with your non-qualified stock options, you can put a lot more flexibility in it because those are completely governed by the company versus incentive stock options are governed by the IRS. So they're a lot more structured. For instance, for an ISO, you couldn't have more than a 10 year expiration period versus the non-qualified stock option. I've seen 20 year expirations on some non qualified It's not common, typically 10 years is the most common for both, but that's just an example of something that you could do. Um, also probably worth noting, just as you're thinking about hiring and um, people leaving the company, stuff like that, ISOs are only considered ISOs for 90 days after an individual leaves the company. They will automatically lose their ISO treatment after that point and typically will just expire unless the company puts something in place to say that those ISOs after 90 days will convert to non-qualified stock options and have some other type of expiration period. With the non-qualified stock options, the company can be really specific about how long people would have until expiration. Typically, 90 days could still be standard on the low end, but if you think about things like death or disability or termination not for cause, um, where someone's laid off, you might be more generous. You might give them a year. You might give them, I've seen all the way through the regular expiration, so that's less common. Um, but just think about some of those considerations as you're putting your plan together and what you want to offer people. Any questions on that? Great. Um, and I will also mention non-qualified stock options could potentially be intra-family transferable, meaning they could be one of the tools in your tool set of transferring company ownership to family members if you want to do that for wealth transfer. Um, we'll hit that topic a little bit more in a minute. But before moving there, just want to briefly touch on restricted stock. Um, I, I know I mentioned it earlier, but um, if you do receive restricted stock in your company, you would want to think about what's known as an 83B election, which basically says, I am choosing to pay my taxes on this on this restricted stock based on the grant price instead of based on the price whenever it vests in the future. Um, that election needs to be made within 30 days of grant. And it can be really powerful and impactful in the startup context because as many of you know, these companies might start off being worth pennies and they end up going to be worth tens of dollars, hundreds of dollars. Um, so paying taxes on something that's worth very little, even though it's ordinary income tax can make a lot of sense, um, assuming you believe the company is going up in the future. So that is a time sensitive election, 30 days from grant for those uh, restricted stocks to make the 83B election. Stop there with all of our deep tax talk unless there's any questions. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit, I guess, about wealth transfer, if you think that'd be helpful, Clayton, or I can skip to Yeah, let's do a little bit about wealth transfer. And one thing I know you, you touched on was the 409A valuation. And I know mm -hmm. you and I, you know, have had conversations in the past and people are further along than you think, and they're, you know, raising money or they're potentially being acquired and they haven't even done one. So just make sure we kind of cover that and why it's important for transfer and that type of thing. Sure. And even to take a step back, I, people often get confused about what a foreign NA even is versus what a valuation is, how they compare. So good point. I'll spend a minute there. Um, when you're a private company, you need to be getting what's known as this foreign NA evaluation done by a third party provider, typically at least annually once you've sized somewhat. Um, 
I mean, annually is the best scenario generally, like pretty much always, but I don't want to scare you guys if you haven't been doing it annually at this point. But it is very important that you are doing it annually if you are granting equity awards, if you're letting people exercise equity awards, or if you're letting people gift, because the IRS will come back and look at that number and say, hey, you were granting options at this value that was based on something that was done two or three years ago. There's no way that that's still an accurate number. And then there can be penalties and problems because you haven't done that by the book. So that's why it's important. Um, the 409A is typically much lower than what a round is going at. So I'll have people come and say to me, well, the round is at $20, but somehow my 409A is like $8 which one do I go off of? How do I think about these two? Whenever you are exercising equity awards, granting equity awards, you're going with that 409A number. Um, but then if someone is selling, like if you're selling into a tender and you're getting $20, then yes, you would pay taxes on that $20 amount. But if there's no tender period, there's no sales period open, you would just be going off of that 409A valuation number. And it's very common that those two will always have a gap between them with the 409A being lower than the valuation. Any questions on that? Okay. So when we think about wealth transfer, high level background, I guess. In the US, there is a concept of lifetime gift exemption. So a certain amount that you as an individual are able to gift in your lifetime or at death before there's any additional taxes on that money from an estate perspective. Currently, the amount that an individual can give is around $11.5 million per person. So it's very high. It's the highest it's ever been. Um, prior to right now, it was at about $5.5 million before the um, 2017 tax changes came into place. And the 11 and a half per person is set to sunset at the end of 2025, but may sunset sooner, depending on the outcome of the election, depending on if it's a blue sweep or whatnot. Um, so it's something that a lot of our clients are thinking about when it comes to gifting. This, again, might feel so far out from where you guys are today. Um, again, your heads are down. You're running the businesses. They might not be worth all of these great numbers at the moment. But it is important to think about some of this stuff because suddenly you might have a company that is worth a substantial amount of money. And it's always better to do some of this planning and this thinking in advance when the company is worth less than when it's already appreciated and is worth more. So, for instance, let's just... Pick, I was going to use an actual company, but we won't do that. Let's say there's some company that's now a publicly traded company. It's huge. Everyone uses it all day long, every day. Um, and they did some gifting back in the day when they were much smaller, still private, versus waiting until they're this big, huge public company that has all of this value. They would have been able to gift fewer shares that are now worth a lot because they did it earlier, versus if they wait, then they can give less shares because they've already appreciated in that way. Um, there's a lot of different strategies we can think about, but suffice it to say, while you are private, A, you get to use that 409A valuation for gifting, B, um, you get to take a discount because the company's private, so think of like a 20 or 30% discount off of that 409A to make those transfers, and there's also other strategies where you can utilize trust and you're just giving away the appreciation. So again, all of that, we could get way more in the weeds on if that was ever interesting to you, but I just want to flag it for you that there could be benefit to gifting some of these shares sooner than later if you do believe that there will be a pop in the future. And so maybe we can, and this is obviously different case by case, but I'm wondering if we can give a little bit of a uh, framework around when it might be the right time to start to consider that. So is it when, you know, you have consistent revenue for a year or two, or you have a product that's really starting to catch on, um, you know, or you branch out more, nationally, um, what kind of signs would you say are showing that you're on a growth trajectory that maybe you will reach those numbers um, that you were talking about, the exclusion amount, um, and you know it might make sense to do now versus waiting? I think it's a two-part thing, right? So A, it's what life phase are you in to begin with, right? Because there's plenty of founders that are in their 20s that don't have kids and transferring to the next generation isn't even on their minds. Though that being said, we work with a ton of clients out in the Bay Area that fit that description, don't have kids, and we are planning trusts for them for their future kids. So there's still stuff to think about. Um, but I would think life phase, and I would think, you know, is this, is this your first venture? Is it not? Because some people, even if it's even if it's a second venture and they have no idea if this will be successful, 
they know that it could be. So they still want to transfer some early on, no matter what, pay whatever that legal fee is that's theoretically minimal compared to what this could be worth and do it. I'd say for the majority of people, especially first time founders, they are going to be waiting until what feels like a year or so before a transaction could really happen. A lot of people honestly wait till a transaction is happening and then they start having these conversations, realize they could have gifted more sooner. It is what it is. They'll still gift to the appreciated value. But I think as soon as you feel comfortable with this could be something, I really believe in it. I would feel better just transferring some to the next generation. Um, we can have those conversations. Yeah. That being said, though, of course, you have to make sure you feel like you have enough for yourself. So that's why I say when it's your first time going through this, maybe you are more reluctant to transfer sooner than later. But certainly as you've gone down these paths or I work with a lot of people who are sort of angel investors or doing friends and family rounds, once they learn about some of this stuff, they will start gifting some of those investments immediately to their kids because they know it might pop. And mm -hmm. if it does, they want to take advantage of that. Sure. So it kind of just depends what stage of life you're in. If you've poured everything you have into the company and that first year of, of profitability, you actually kind of need to uh, use that a little bit for yourself. Obviously, it's not going to be the right time. Um, but at a minimum, if you if you are having success and there may be a transaction a year or so away, um, that's kind of the latest, at which point you can still use the 409A and, and get the maximum out of that. So. And with all of this, I think there's there's the tax strategies and what makes sense from that perspective, but you really have to bring it back to you and what makes sense for your situation, what's right for you, what feels good. Um, I talk to people a lot when they're going through tender offers and they want to be smart about taxes, but they also are like, hey, this is a chance for me to pay off my student loans and have a down payment for a house. And I just, I want that money. And that's not a wrong decision. That's a great decision for them and for their lives. I think it's just important to understand the bigger picture of what's happening maybe take some of it off the table, not all of it, and be more strategic with the rest of it. But just knowing that this is out there and feeling good about the decisions that you make, that's all that you can ever hope for. Yeah, and that's a great point. And that's kind of my role, which I didn't necessarily introduce. But uh, you know, at JP Morgan, I get resources and, and a team around me like Kaylin to be able to provide all this advice. And then for me, it's putting a plan together with the people that I'm talking to and helping them figure out what is the best use um, you know, should I pay down some loans? Should I, you, am I going to need to use this? Should I invest it into the, the market, et cetera? So we kind of help people figure out, you know, first, what are your goals? What are we actually trying to accomplish here? Because, I mean, we find founders that are very successful and they don't really know, you know, what's the end game? What are they doing this for? Is this, you know, to have a wealth to pass down to their children or is this uh, to be able to spend a certain amount? Um, and so we kind of help talk through that with them, figure out what their goals are. And then at that point, that can frame up what the best strategies are and what they should be doing. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, further down the line conversations that we have as we get more specific with people's situation. Definitely. Um, I think one of the last things that it's worth mentioning would be employment agreements. So again, for any of you who either might have one in place now, might not, Employment agreements can make a lot of sense for you to put in place to protect yourself in the anticipation of having a future transaction, which if you're in the startup world, I think your goal is to have a transaction. So you want to make sure that you as a founder or as an employee are well protected. Things that you want to make sure are included here would be what happens in a change in control. So a change in control is any acquisition, things like that, where you are no longer in control of the company. Um, what happens to unvested equity awards during that time? you would expect to see them either automatically vest just because the change in control happened, or at the very least, there should be what's known as a double trigger, meaning change in control happens and then you're terminated within a certain period of time, then automatically everything should vest. So you wanna make sure you have those protections in place. You also wanna have it very clear if the company's gonna buy back stock at any point, how are they valuing what that, what that stock is worth? How are they assessing the fair market value does that feel like a fair strategy? Does it not? I've read some of these employment agreements where it will say, we will pay you back cost basis for your shares. We will pay you back 75% of cost basis for your shares. That's horrible. So you want to look for some of that language and make sure you're well protected. Other things I sort of alluded to earlier, but what happens in the case of death or disability? Again, do you have a longer period of time to exercise some of your options? Typically, if there is no extension, then 
options expire in 90 days and God forbid your family's mourning you and like not dealing with figuring out if your options have been exercised. They don't even know what options are. So you should at least have a year for your estate to sort of figure that out. Um, there might even be some severance payments that could be made in some of those cases. You also definitely want it to be defined um, what happens if you're terminated not for cause, so you're laid off, or what happens if you're terminated for good reason, which is sort of technical language, meaning you are allowed to say I'm quitting the company because things like your reporting line has changed, so you previously reported to the CEO, now you don't, so you could leave if you wanted to. The headquarters were previously in Minneapolis, and now they want you to go work in Timbuktu and you don't want to go there. Um, that could be a reason. So you want all of that stuff outlined. You also want to be careful that you're not signing on for a non-compete that is too long or too stringent. So typically, if you have to sign a non-compete, you should be getting a severance for that comparable period. So I like to think maybe a one-year non-compete, but I'm getting a severance for one year. Fine. It kind of balances out. Um, but I have seen people try to put in five-year non-competes anywhere in the world and in like any industry, but I'm only paying you for one year. That doesn't feel fair. Um, how are you going to live if you can't really work or do anything? So just be mindful of some of those as you're reviewing them. Um, certainly seek some guidance there from an employment attorney. But um, I've also talked to a lot of folks who say, I don't have an employment agreement in place. Me and my board were really close. It's good. I trust them. That's great. You trust them. It's wonderful until it's not. So you don't know when someone else is going to come in and join the board, when something's going to get shaken up. So if you do, if you are fortunate enough to have a good relationship with the board right now, or you have a lot of say, that would be a good time to put something in place to protect you. And if someone is coming to acquire you, certainly they can negotiate any of those points, but at least you have something to stand on that you're starting from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the employment agreement thing is, is a little tricky because you do have to pay an attorney to get you know, a well-written one in place. Um, but you really can't do it too soon because I've seen examples of even co-founders, um, you know, or a, a main founder brings in someone and gives them founding shares, you know, very early on. And, you know, that person didn't have all the qualifications that they said they did. And, you know, you, if you don't have the employment agreement in place, you don't have that as one of the reasons that they can be like, oh, and you can call your shares back. Um, you're in a tough spot. So that's just it's something that does you know cost some money to put in place but it's something that's important to do the right way and if again if cost is prohibitive it would be worth trying to jam some of this into your uh, equity plan document as it is so sometimes the equity plan documents will talk about what happens under a change in control or what happens on death or disability so some of that might be able to be captured in your equity plan document but i still think it's helpful to have an overarching employment agreement just in case to protect yourself Any questions on any of this? All right. Any other things I didn't cover? Clayton? Here's that one in the chat. Um, yeah, uh, definitely happy to help, uh, Neil. We can definitely talk about that. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll kind of just stick around once we're done with the actual content. And if anyone listening in does want to kind of hang out and we can have a little bit of a smaller group uh, Q&A uh, just in the same venue here. So we'll, we'll definitely be able to talk to that and we can also follow up later as well. We'll stick around but if there's nothing else it was great being here with all of you today and happy to help you dive in a little bit more um, to the extent that you come across some of these questions or get into the weeds with it at your own company um, happy to be here as a resource yeah and so i think you know some of the things again just to review what we've helped people with is it's reviewing these employment agreements it's taking a look at their equity plans you know just talking to them specifically about what they have in place and seeing um, where there might be things they could tweak or things they should be aware of um, and, you know, we're happy to have those kind of basic uh, early on conversations as well as, you know, have those conversations as, as you get closer to a potential transaction, making sure you're doing 
uh, the strategies for either gifting to children in, uh, in advance or looking at QSBS that we talked about in the beginning. Um, so, you know, definitely uh, helps to have um, us take a look at things as well as uh, be able to, like Neil asked, refer uh, to the right people that can put things in place for you. All right. So I think we'll just kind of hang out. Um, if people want to stick around and either share audio and video or um, however you want to do it, we'll, we'll just kind of stick around for some questions um, here. So Neil, I think the, the best way for yours, um, let's follow up via email um, and we'll, we'll get in touch there um, just so I can make sure I go about this, you know, the right way as far as getting you some, some names. So um, we'll, we'll definitely follow up on that. And I, my email is in the chat for, for anyone that wants to just shoot me a message. Um, feel free, happy to connect. Uh, so that, that's there for you if you'd like to. Looks like we still have seven people listening in. So if there's any other questions or anything, um, you know, we're, we're here. We're we're done with the with all of the you know talking at you and giving you all of the information. Um, but when this really becomes impactful, is answering specific questions for people because everyone's situation is different. So, uh, like I said, my email's there if you want to follow up. Otherwise, we'll just hang out a, a couple more minutes if anyone wants to um, jump in and ask some questions. Okay, so here's a question in the chat um, asking how do they compensate advisors? Is that um, specifically like advisory board type positions where, you know, maybe they're um, an experienced entrepreneur and they're just kind of giving advice or are you thinking more contract employees? I just want to clarify that, Neil. I'll start while you're waiting for the clarification. There, he, he did say, you know, more advisory um, board members, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so if you are compensating advisors, then certainly it needs to be non-qualified stock options and not incentive stock options, just because ISOs are only available for W-2 employees, not for consultants or advisors. So it would need to be via non-qualified stock options. Um, I'd also say make sure... When you're bringing them on, you really do need to make that grant right then. I've run into a lot of situations where people have been on advisory boards and they've gotten a handshake deal where, hey, I'm going to give you some equity, but I haven't granted it to you formally yet. And then we're a year, two years down the line. The grant still hasn't been made. Now the 409A is higher. They feel like they're getting a bad end of the deal since, um, you know, when you agreed to 10,000 options at a dollar, now the price is at $5 and you're still trying to only give me 10,000 options, that feels wrong. Um, so definitely just make sure you're doing it when you're bringing them on. Non-qualified stock options make the most sense. Um, I would put a vesting period in there, I think, as well. Just you want them to stay on with you for a longer period of time and not just here's some money, bye-bye now. Um, so I, I would think that you could probably put something comparable into what you're doing with your regular employees. Four-year vest, three-year vest, whatever. Um, probably a one-year cliff and then monthly, but some people do monthly from the beginning. I think that's all somewhat negotiable, but just make sure that non-qualified stock options and you have a clear plan sort of in place for that. Yeah, and I think that's a good point of, you know, easing into it, not dumping everything all at once, and then also, uh, you know, making the vesting period just so that you make sure they're, they're in this to help you for the long term. 
um, and they're, you know, actually adding value. Um, and so, you know, if it's something where you can grant them some options when they come on, but you're doing it monthly and, you know, it can increase if, if they become a really valuable advisor to you, that kind of thing. So um, it's all important stuff. Mm -hmm. You could also potentially give them restricted stuff, but I think options are totally fine as well. Uh, Caitlin, one thing we didn't really touch on is actually, you know, giving out common stock or is common stock really ever, is that ever a good idea to think about giving um, straight up stock or founder shares or anything like that? No, not really. <laughs> um, I think if you're bringing on a co-founder, you could think about that. Do you want to be, do you want to have them buy in equity the same way that you might have bought in equity? Or do you want that to be restricted stock where... There's, again, a vesting period. I think there's mixed feelings on that, but I think the co-founder situation would be the only one that it's not even giving them the common. It's like they have to buy it still. But um, that could be a time where that opportunity makes sense. But otherwise, I would think restricted stock or something with vesting is the best way to go. Okay. Okay. We'll just pause for another 20 seconds here, see if anyone has any last questions. And then we will... Uh, log off and probably go join some other Twin City Startup Week events. I think there's a lot going on today. I guess one thing I didn't mention, there's a couple people left with us. Um, this is the healthcare track this, you know, today. So um, obviously uh, I've had a lot, of, a lot of conversations with people that are taking um, companies and products um, and devices through FDA approval. Um, it can be a crazy process and a long process and a hard process. But the good thing with that is a lot of times going through the different stages, you do actually kind of have a timeline for uh, when you have a viable product or when you might look to either commercialize or be acquired. Um, and so that is kind of conducive to doing a lot of these strategies because uh, you kind of know, all right, in 2022, we should have a product and we could potentially be acquired. So whereas when you're just working, you know, at the startup and it's, you know, whatever you can success you can create is w is when you get there. Uh, that can be a little tougher. So that is one benefit of um, you know if we're talking medical device, you do have somewhat of a timeline. So I just wanted to throw that out there as we've had conversations. All right, I think with that we will we'll jump off. Thanks everyone for joining. If you're still on, again, email is in the chat. If you have any further questions. Kaylin, thank you for all of your information and joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. All right. Thanks.